Okay, we begin today with uh, the epistle of Jude, Jude for beginners. Uh, we're going to cover verses 1 to 16 in this one chapter epistle. This is part one of a two-part series. Well, you know, in a regular uh, adult Bible class, uh, there are a variety of ways to approach uh, the study of God's Word. The most common approach is to, you know, you study about a person, you pick a character in the Bible, or you pick a topic or an event or a specific teaching or doctrine, you know, and you, you kind of, kind of, you, you go through the Bible or through the New Testament, if you wish, uh, always looking at all the passages that have to do with that person or that event or that particular, uh, that particular teaching. Um, these types of lessons, uh, you know, where you're looking at you know, a person or a teaching or an event or something like that. They're called uh, uh, topical lessons because the teacher uh, has a topic or a person and teaches us what the Bible says about that particular uh, person or topic and so on and so forth. But um, this is not the, uh, the only style of preaching and teaching, as you well know. Um, another approach is called expository preaching or expository teaching. Uh, expository preaching is where a teacher focuses on a single verse of scripture. One, you know, he picks one verse of scripture and explains the meaning of that verse of scripture in the context of the entire passage in which it is found, as well as the context of the entire uh, Bible. So in expository teaching, the key is to determine what the passage, you know, the selected passage, what does that passage mean or what did it mean to the people it was originally spoken to? And then once you've kind of discovered that, you kind of make, uh, you make applications in the, um, in the modern era or for today's uh, hearers. Now aside from uh, topical uh, lessons or sermons and expository uh, Bible teaching and preaching. There's also what's called textual uh, preaching and teaching. This is where the teacher will try to explain the purpose and the content of an entire chapter uh, or even an entire book of the, of the Bible. And the, uh, the goal of uh, textual preaching or teaching is to summarize the reasons why the book was written, uh, who wrote that book uh, or epistle, and what it said to the people of that time, as well as what it says to the people of, uh, of today. So you, know, you may be wondering, why, why, am I, you know, why am I explaining all of this uh, as we go into uh, the study of the Epistle of Jude? Well, the reason I'm telling you, giving you this little bit of background, is this, this two-part series that we are uh, doing is a textual lesson that will review the author and the content and the purpose of this particular uh, epistle. So just a few preliminary remarks before we begin our actual study. So let's take a look at, uh, you know, in, that, uh, in that context you know, of doing a textual study, let's do a, a, a little bit of background about Jude, the individual uh, whose name is attached to, to this uh, particular uh, epistle. We know that Jude names himself in the very first verse of this uh, epistle, and says that he is the brother of James. Now the fact that he assumes that his readers will know who James is suggests uh, that uh, it is the James, you know, one of the uh, leaders of the Jerusalem church at the time, and uh, uh, the writer of the epistle uh, of James. You know, the fact that there's no uh, there's no explanatory information about who this James is uh, uh, suggests that he was the James that was well known in the church uh, for his epistle and of course for his leadership in the key Jerusalem church as I mentioned. Uh, so this would make Jude another brother of Jesus, an uh, earthly brother of Jesus. We know in Matthew uh, chapter 13 verse 55, Matthew names Jesus' earthly brothers um, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, which is another form of the name Jude. Now along with his brothers, uh, Jude uh, did not believe while Jesus was ministering uh, here on earth and must have been converted after the resurrection. 
and um, we know therefore that he was with the apostles in the upper room on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we learn about that in Acts chapter 1 verse 14. Now there's not a lot of information about Jude, uh, only what we can gather from you know, putting together the, uh, the clues, if you wish, in, in his epistle. But church historian Eusebius in 96 AD wrote that Jude, the brother of Jesus, suffered the arrest of his grandsons during the Roman persecution. And uh, they told, apparently, they told the emperor at that time that they were farmers and that the kingdom of Jesus was not of this world, but of the next world when Jesus would return uh, to judge everyone. Aside from that mention in, the, in, the, in history, we don't know much else about this particular person, uh, the writer of the uh, letter of Jude. Now the epistle itself, take a look at that. Um, there are similarities between Jude's epistle, epistle is a word that means letter, so you know, they're interchangeable. Uh, there are similarities between Jude's epistle and the second chapter of 2 Peter. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the passages is a direct quote. Uh, this has led to the conclusion that during the period when various heresies were entering into the church at that time, Peter the apostle wrote his second epistle in order to refute uh, some of the false doctrine that was being spread in the church. Now Jude had been intending to write an epistle with a, with a broad theme, something based on the idea that you know, salvation is only in Jesus Christ. He writes about that in verse three. But when he recognized the threat to the church after reading Peter's second letter, he wrote this much shorter and much more pointed epistle concerning the very same subject that Peter was writing about. Remember, these people here are contemporaries and they're reading each other's material and they're circulating in the same, uh, in the same circles. Now there's been no doubt about the authorship uh, of this letter by Jude uh, and the subject matter suggests that it was written around the same time or perhaps uh, slightly later uh, than 2 Peter, and that would put it around 67 uh, AD. Now it took a while for the letter to be accepted into the New Testament canon, uh, a canon, the, that term canon, not like a canon, like a, a gun, you know, but canon, C-A-N-O-N, uh, means a, a measure. And it was the, uh, the canon of the New Testament uh, refers to those books which measured up, if you wish, uh, which were permitted to be included in the group of books which are considered inspired. So the New Testament canon is made up of those books which measured up, if you wish, to be included in that group. So it took a while for this particular letter to be accepted into the New Testament canon because of its brevity and the fact that it refers to non-inspired sources. Uh, you'll see as we study that Jude refers to Enoch and then to the book of Moses. And these are two books that were not in the Old Testament canon. In other words, they weren't inspired books. And so there was some question uh, as to should we include an epistle or a letter in the canon that refers to other material that is not in the canon. But eventually, eventually it was. Eventually its authenticity and the soundness of its teaching were recognized and accepted as inspired material. Now, Jude's goal in this letter was to encourage or exhort the church not to depart from the established teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles. And you know, he was telling them to stick to that and not move towards the false teaching of the false teachers at, the, at that time, uh, who were teaching a, a form of uh, Gnosticism, and I'll explain what that means uh, in a moment. So from his writings, we conclude that there existed in the first century a body of Christian doctrine that was recognized as authoritative and complete for the purpose of evangelization and teaching and so on and so forth. Um, and according to his writing, this body of information, this body of Christian teaching was not to be added to or taken away from or changed in any way. So this is the, the main thrust of his uh, exhortation to those who are reading his letter. 
Now we, in the churches of Christ, we believe that this body of doctrine was recorded and preserved in the Bible, and as Jude wrote in his epistle, uh, in the modern day, today, we're very careful to teach and to preserve and to pass on this body of doctrine to the next generation, and we encourage them, of course, to do the very same thing until Jesus comes. So this approach to scripture is uh, actually unique uh, in many ways to our brotherhood, and it's one of the important ways that we are different than many of our neighbors in the uh, religious uh, community. All right, so there's a little bit of background about the times in which this letter was written, uh, some information about Jude himself, uh, the letter, how it was accepted in the early church, and uh, a little bit about uh, the uh, main theme or main idea. So let's take a look ab uh, at uh, the, um, the outline of this letter. Jude's letter focuses on the danger of following or teaching things which are false, and so the outline follows this particular theme. So you have the salutation in verses one and two, uh, then the danger at hand, he explains what the danger is to the church, uh, verses three and four. Uh, then he talks about the people who are bringing this danger, who are causing this danger, verses five to 16, uh, an exhortation or an encouragement uh, uh, to, 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 to avoid the danger and how to avoid this particular danger and then a doxology or, or praise uh, in the last uh, couple of verses. All right, so there's the outline. Let's start to look at this text uh, as we follow the same, um, the same outline for our study. So we begin with verses one and two. He says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Now the name Jude could be a form of common names of that era, Judas or Jacob, that the writer changed for obvious reasons. You know, he wouldn't want to call himself Judas and be confused with the uh, disciple or the apostle that had betrayed the Lord. So what does he say about itself, himself? Well, he claims to be a bondservant or a slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, which, as I mentioned, helps us fix exactly who he is in the context of that time and that family and, and, and the church. So this is an indirect way, if you wish, of referring to his other relationship with Jesus as his earthly brother. He doesn't come out and say it, I think humility you know, uh, humility restrains him from actually saying it, but he says it in an indirect way. Uh, everyone knew that James was an earthly brother of Jesus, and so he says, well, I'm a, I'm a brother of James, and so it's left to the reader to kind of you know, connect the dots, if you wish. We know that James uh, was killed by the Jews in 66 AD, and uh, this letter here may have been Jude's attempt to step into his brother's place as one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Uh, natural, he was involved, he was recognized. His brother, James, uh, a very important uh, leader in the Jerusalem uh, congregation, is killed. And so Jude you know, steps up to fill uh, some of the vacuum left behind. So he refers to the church uh, in these first two verses in three ways, very interesting. He, first of all, refers to the church as the called. Uh, in the Greek, uh, which is the language of the New Testament, uh, ecclesia, uh, which literally meant the called out. Now, originally, uh, this term ecclesia or the called out was a term used for the elders or the leaders of a city or a village who were chosen or called out to occupy a certain position, a position of leadership, you know, like the city council or the city fathers, if you wish. Uh, but Jesus took this term and applied it to those who were called out of the world by the gospel and became His people, the church. And ultimately, this term, ecclesia, was used exclusively uh, in reference to uh, the church. So he refers to the church as the called, then as the beloved in God the Father. 
Now these people, the church, have a new status in regards to God. They're no longer condemned sinners, they're no longer enemies of God because of disbelief. Jude says they are now beloved and cherished, uh, a, special, a specially loved group uh, by God. And then the third term, kept for Jesus. Same, he's, you know, three ways of referring to the very same people. God's hand, uh, he says, is protecting these people from the second death, from condemnation and punishment, so they can be with Jesus forever when He returns. So their end, he says at the very beginning of the letter, uh, will be different than the destiny of others. They are kept aside, they're, they're protected, they're kept safe uh, for the time that they will be transported, if you wish, or changed or glorified uh, into a heavenly realm with Jesus. So after this introduction and greeting, he moves on to the, to the matter at hand. This is verse three and four. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. He begins by sharing the motivation behind you know, his writing of this particular letter. His original thought was to write to them a, a kind of a summary of the Christian faith and encourage them to, you know, persevere in the, in the faith and, and, and pass, on, pass it on to other people. But it seems that he changed the substance of his letter and redirected the thought to deal with some of the issues that Peter, as I mentioned before, that Peter the Apostle dealt with in his second epistle. So this was the influence, uh, what he's talking about here is the influence of the Gnostic teachers and the Gnostic type doctrine that was being promoted in the church. Now the persons that he mentions um, are the teachers who have crept in to teach these things um, in, the, in the church. And he says that these people were marked and judged beforehand. Now the fact that he says this is a reference to Peter's epistle and the denunciation of these people. Uh, uh, Peter talks about the very same people, very same problem in 2 Peter chapter 2 uh, and following. And he says that their sin is that according to their teachings, um, anything done in the body has no effect on the soul. That, that was the essence of the false teaching that was uh, beginning to creep into the church uh, at the hand of these, uh, of these teachers. The idea that whatever you did had no effect on your soul. So this this idea here led to all kinds of immoral behavior, effectively turning the idea of God's grace into a kind of permission to do pretty much anything you wanted to do. You know, the net result of this kind of thinking and lifestyle was to grossly disrespect the fact that Jesus sacrificed His body in death to obtain forgiveness for the very things that these teachers were uh, promoting. You know, they were saying, look, uh, whatever you do, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect the soul. You know, they, it was based on the idea of duality. There was a separation you know, between the body and the, you know, the, the spirit and the flesh. You know, they, didn't, they didn't commingle in any way. So whatever you did in the body was just in the body. It didn't affect the soul. It didn't affect the spirit. Well, you know, that, was a, that, was a, that was a dangerous teaching. You know, that was a very dangerous teaching. We'll talk about how this you know, uh, would play out uh, in the congregation and in the minds of people. In the end, he says, uh, Jude says, in the end the false teachers were found guilty of denying Jesus and the danger for those who followed them was that they would be guilty of the same, the same kind of sin that, uh, that the teachers were guilty of. So you know, they, were, they were dangerous people who were going into, the, uh, going into the church. Let's read some more when he talks about these. He says, um, now I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who, um, 
who, who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And then he says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So what's he talking about here? You know, first of all, he's talking about this you know, false doctrine permeating, uh, and then these men here who are teaching this uh, are, are, are going to be condemned. Well, he mentions here, he gives examples of what happened to various individuals who disobeyed or disbelieved in the past. So he mentions the Israelites at first. You know, they were God's people and they were freed from slavery in a miraculous way. But Jude says, when they disbelieved and rebelled, God destroyed them in the desert. I mean, from, from the generation that left Egypt, the only people that made it to the promised land uh, alive was, uh, were uh, Joshua and Caleb. All the others died in the desert. And why, Jude said, because of their disbelief, because of their disobedience. Then he mentions angels. He says angels who are, you know, of course, more powerful beings than human, were also punished when some of them rebelled against God. They each were created and were placed at a certain station or rule or dominion in the spiritual world. We know that, Ephesians 1 verse 21, Colossians 1 16 tells us that. However, Jude says, uh, some of them were dissatisfied with their place and they desired a position not available to them and what happened? They were punished for their pride. Now, you know, there's a lot of speculation about this. We, we, you know, we don't know the details of this rebellion, about the angels, only that it happened and the results. Now some think that the sin here that Jude is talking about um, is that angels you know, took wives. Um, let's look at a passage here. Um, in um, Genesis chapter six, uh, verses one to four, it says, Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of, uh, men of renown. So uh, this passage here where, where uh, Jude is talking about angels and they went after strange flesh, some people believe or the theory suggests that angels uh, took uh, uh, women as, uh, as wives, and this theory suggests that in doing so they created a race of like super type humans who led the rush to wickedness that eventually resulted in the flood. Um, and, 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 and those who, who promote this idea, this theory, suggest that this was an attempt by Satan to destroy humans and of course avoid the eventual coming of Christ. Again, speculation about what exactly Jude is, uh, uh, is talking about. So uh, let's get back to our main point, right? So Jude is saying the false teachers are going to be judged and he gives some history about others who were judged for disbelief and disobedience. The Israelites, for example, were judged for uh, uh, disbelief and and disobedience. Then he mentions the angels who left their proper place. Whatever they did, they disobeyed God. They also uh, were, um, uh, were uh, punished. And then he mentions uh, the pagans. They also are punished. Uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their disobedience of God uh, and their disobedience of God's law concerning sexual conduct. They were destroyed by fire. So, the point that Jude is making here is that regardless of the person or the being, whether it is a saved person, you know, like the Israelites, a chosen person by God, or a spiritual being like an angel, or even a pagan people like the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah, and 
by extension, even a Christian who denies Christ somehow, if you disobey God's command, if you deny God's Savior, if you disbelieve His word, Jude is saying, you will be punished and you will be destroyed. So a very strong warning against the false teachers uh, and their teaching and those who are seduced by that and go over to that particular teaching. Okay, so now Jude turns his attention to the false teachers themselves, uh, not just their judgment, their eventual judgment, but those people themselves, and he describes the manner in which they operate and the sins that they commit in their quest to capture unsuspecting souls. So let's read verses eight, nine, and 10, shall we? It says, yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. Uh, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals. By these things they are destroyed. So the things these false teachers teach have no basis authority, uh, this is what Jude is saying, uh, like uh, apostolic teaching uh, and, and, and divine interpretation. All right? they, they have no authority to teach like the apostles have authority to teach. Uh, Jude is saying their work is a result of nothing more than their imagination, their dreams. The results of their dreaming, however, are threefold. First of all, he says, they cause men to defile their flesh. In other words, they cause men uh, to, uh, uh, to participate in immoral behavior. Well, think about that for a second. If you believe the idea that nothing you do in your body has any effect on your soul or on your spirit, well, then you can do whatever you want in your body, you know, conscious free, right? With an open, you know, a clear conscience. You can commit adultery, you can, participate in any form of, of, of sexual immorality or dishonesty or whatever because you're saying you know, whatever I'm doing in my flesh it has no effect uh, on my soul. So that's one of the results of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the teaching. Another one it says they reject the authority of Christ and His word over them. The idea there is this is not at all what Jesus taught and what the apostles taught. So by teaching this and accepting their particular doctrine, uh, the brothers there, the, the, the Christians there, were in effect rejecting Christ, rejecting His authority. And then he says, uh, they insult, they the teachers, they insult angelic beings who are greater than they are with their attitude and teachings. Perhaps they're teaching, uh, they the false teachers, perhaps they're also teaching incorrect things about the role of angels and so on and so forth. And by doing so, they insult uh, the angels. And he uses Michael the archangel, uh, his humility in not bringing you know, uh, a curse on, um, on Satan. So Jude cites an inspired example of what angels are really like and how they act in regards to respect for Christ. And that final passage where he talks about uh, Michael the archangel, in a situation where Michael would have reason to pronounce judgment on Satan, he restrains himself and defers to Christ's judgment, knowing that this is not his place, only the place of Christ. In other words, Christ will do the judging. Christ will do the judging. So even a mighty angel who is greater than a human being in power and so on and so forth will not you know, pronounce judgment, will not leave his place, will not do something against God's word like these false teachers. So these men, these teachers, however, they have no such restraint, no such respect for the Lord, and they act like animals, he says, following not reason or revelation, but like animals following their feelings, their instincts. And he says they're going to end up like animals who are oblivious to the fact that they're being fattened for the purpose of slaughter. You know, God permits their disobedience and rebellion 
so that there will be no question that their punishment will be justified when it comes. It's as if God is saying, go ahead, do your worst. You know? But there'll be no excuse at the end when you are judged and when you are punished. So in verse 11, it says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, who perished in the rebellion of Korah. So Jude names other infamous people who, like these false teachers, faced condemnation and punishment for following unrighteousness. Uh, he uses uh, Cain, for example, as an example. Uh, what happened to Cain? We know what happened to Cain. He was ostracized, he was marked. Then he talks about Balaam. Balaam was a false prophet who led the Israelites into idolatry and then uh, later was killed for his, uh, for his rebellion. And, and if we remember also in the Old Testament, the sons of Korah, they rebelled against Moses' authority. And what happened to them? They were swallowed up by the earth. We read about that in Numbers uh, chapter 16, verse one. So these false teachers will all be destroyed like their predecessors. Basically what Jude is saying, giving example after example of those who acted in, in the same way as these false teachers and what happened to them. So let's read verses 12 and 13. He says, These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. So Jude rebukes these false teachers for their sins and basically points out how worthless they are. And, and I don't know if you noted here the ways that he talks about how worthless they are. First of all, he says they are, they are reefs that present the unseen danger in what seems like a calm water of congregational life. You know, the reefs are always underwater, the, 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 the water looks calm, and you think you, you, know, you can just take your boat or ship, but the reefs lie underneath you know, and, and present danger. And he says, well, they're like reefs. They're under the surface there, the calm water of peace and love in the congregation, but underneath you know, there's the danger of these guys here, their, their work, their teachings uh, to destroy the church. Uh, he, he, t he says they're like waterless clouds, promising a lot but delivering nothing. He says they're like fruitless trees that require care and pruning and, and so on and so forth, but they don't produce anything, so therefore they're not worth anything. He calls them waves that make noise and produce only their shameful deeds as a result. And then he says, they're like wandering stars. You know? In other words, not fixed stars that are of some use, but wandering stars that will be swallowed by the blackness of hell. So quite a, quite a rebuke, quite a, a powerful re, uh, rebuke here. So Jude delivers a stinging attack on the value and character of the ones advocating this false doctrine, this false teaching, and also this immoral and unfaithful lifestyle that this particular teaching seems to uh, produce. So he goes on and uh, talks about, in verse 14 and 15, it says, he says, it was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude does something interesting here I mentioned at the beginning. He goes to an unusual source for a prophecy against such people and how they will be, uh, how they will be punished. Now, so far, Jude has referred to the Old Testament, to you know, different chapters in the Old Testament, and also to Peter's epistle for quotes and for ideas you know, to build his case. But now, he goes to the book of Enoch as a basis for how God will treat the likes of these false teachers. So let me tell you a little bit about the book of Enoch, shall we? Now, um, uh, uh, the book of Enoch was, uh, or rather not the book of Enoch, but Enoch 
was the seventh generation from Adam. And as Genesis chapter five, verses 21 to 27 says, Enoch was a prophet of God for his generation. Uh, Enoch was the father of Methuselah, right? We know Methuselah, the oldest recorded uh, lifespan, Methuselah. So Enoch was the father of Methuselah, and he, it says that Enoch did not suffer death, but was taken up by God. So in some way, Enoch's prophecies were handed down verbally and then in written form, um, uh, so that the Jews of the first century had access to them in some way. Now, even though Enoch's words or book were not sufficiently accessible or complete enough to be included in the Old Testament canon, right, those inspired writings, Enoch's book was not included in that group of writings, it seems that Jude, as an inspired writer, used a portion of his ancient prophecies to apply them to this particular situation. So Enoch spoke of the end times when God would judge all evil men, and Jude uses this, uh, this quotation, if you wish, to apply to these particular men in his uh, time and in his generation. Now we don't know why. You know, why did Jude use Enoch's words? You know, we, don't, we don't know why. But we do know, however, that the words fit the occasion. So I'll make a speculation here. Uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, Jude is using a non-inspired non -inspired, you know, source here um, to show that their type, in other words, these false teachers, these type of evil men, were always known, even in antiquity, and their end uh, was predicted from long ago. So the point I'm making here is that he uses Enoch, uh, you know, a, a writer and a, and, a, and a person that goes all the way back to uh, before the flood, okay? And, and, and he shows that even in those ancient times, the prophets of God knew who evil men were and knew what would become of them in God's judgment. So he's saying, look, this is, even the men of old knew these guys and knew what would happen to him, and, and so he brings it forward and he says, these are the same types, the same spirit, the same evil is going on, and the same judgment will be visited upon these uh, individuals. And then in verse 16 he says, these are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. So verse 16 is a kind of a bridge, if you wish, to the final section of the letter where Jude will address the faithful and encourage them. He's, he's finished talking about the evil ones. He's talked about the teaching and the emptiness of their teaching, the danger of their teaching. He's talked about the, the individuals who are doing the teaching and what will happen to them. And in our next lesson, we're going to take a look at some of the things uh, that, um, uh, that, he, that Jude says to the faithful about maintaining their faith. So in this verse, he describes the character and the style of these men. And as I said, he's going to go on to encourage the faithful not to emulate their particular actions. Okay, so there's a, the starting lesson, the first portion of Jude. We're going to continue in this series, another lesson next time we meet. Thank you very much for your, for your attention.